Never have I ever met a more hated and feared hormone than cortisol. Eating clean and not losing weight? Cortisol. Always thirsty and craving carbs? Cortisol. Working out and yet gaining belly fat? Cortisol, cortisol, cortisol. Cortisol is the key factor in explaining any disappointing disruption to the predicted energy balance equation. It is the alleged reason why you just cannot seem to lose those last 10 pounds or why your pants size is slowly inching up every single year. But is it a legitimate factor or just the convenient scapegoat? As we say, there's a lot here to unpack. Hey everyone, I'm Abby Sharp. Welcome to Abby's Kitchen. In today's video, we'll be talking about cortisol and weight gain. Does it actually matter and what you can do about it? A big thank you to Eric Williamson and his team at Unlocked Fitness and Nutrition for the support on this script. I will be linked to their website below if you're looking for any one-on-one -on -one support for evidence-based weight loss, as well as any kind of fitness sports nutrition. They really are the best. And make sure to check out my disclaimer and content notes. We are talking weight loss today and also to get a link to my free Hunger Crushing Combo ebook. Okay, so let me interrupt for a hot minute here to talk about the importance of sleep and my sponsor ate sleep. I like sleep. Do you guys like sleep? Because as someone who has struggled with insomnia for years, eat sleep has completely changed the game. I got so much great feedback from this the last time I mentioned eat sleep. So clearly a lot of you guys feel the same. So the pod cover by eat sleep fits any bed like a fitted sheet and improves your sleep by adjusting to your ideal body temperature based on your needs, phases of sleep and environment. I run really, really hot, especially mid morning when I tend to wake up too early while my my husband is always complaining that it's too cold. And the pod cover allows us to set the temperature of our bed between 55 and 110 degrees Fahrenheit on each side so that we can both be comfortable. And it's not just about better comfort, there's actual science to back this up. So research suggests that we fall asleep best when the temperature drops between one and three degrees Fahrenheit. And then when we need to wake up, the temperature should gradually climb. So the pod monitors your body's temperature and adjusts it up and down to keep you in the optimal zone for your bed, your preferences, and the environment. It also tracks and collects data while you sleep without you having to wear any kind of uncomfortable wearable device. And it also can replace your blaring alarm in the morning with a gentle chest level vibration and a gradual increase in temperature, which helps you naturally wake up without the unpleasant shock to the system. I fully realize that this is a higher ticket item, but I've really come to realize over the past few years of struggling with sleep that you just cannot put a price on a good sleep. We have ample evidence that sleep is one of the most important modifiable factors contributing to health. Mental health, weight management, stress management, immunity, cognitive health, chronic disease risk, and more. And the numbers speak for themselves. So pause sleepers fall asleep 44% faster and get into a 34% deeper sleep. It's honestly been life-changing for someone like me. So if you want to try out the pod cover yourself, you can check out the link in my description and use my promo code Abby to get $150 off of your order. And thank you again to 8sleep for sponsoring this video. You can check out the link in my description and use my promo code Abby to get $150 off of your order. All right, I'm going to make my kids some muffins here. Super quick little overview. Cortisol is a stress hormone that helps mobilize fuel for our body to use as energy. Typically, a stressor is perceived by our brain, which then activates the sympathetic nervous system to release adrenaline and cortisol from the adrenal glands. When cortisol levels rise, glucose, fat, and protein get broken down and are released into the bloodstream for our muscles to utilize. This means that it also increases blood glucose levels, again, in the assumption that our body needs that energy to deal with the stressor at hand. So anytime people hear the word cortisol or even stressor, we immediately think that's bad. But cortisol stimulation is actually essential in a lot of situations. Transient increases in cortisol, like in the morning to get you moving and out of the bed, during or following exercise, and even during stress like public speaking, are all positive signs of healthy cortisol secretion. Without cortisol levels rising, we would basically just be vegetables. That said, chronically high levels could make accomplishing certain health goals more challenging. So first let's talk about cortisol 
and belly fat. So chronically high cortisol is associated with both weight gain and having a higher BMI in many, but not necessarily all studies. So one study, for example, found that those with high cortisol gain 1.12 kilograms over six months, whereas those with lower cortisol gain about 0.53 kilograms. Also, if we look at something like Cushing syndrome, which is a medical condition characterized by excessive cortisol production, we typically do see higher belly fat and lower muscle mass. Interestingly, while cortisol can increase the net fat breakdown across the body, it conversely results in a decrease in fat breakdown around the intra-abdominal area. And it's this belly fat, aka visceral fat, that is most closely related to chronic disease. And this is really where the concern around cortisol and health lies. So how does this all happen? Let's unpack. First, let's talk about the association between high intensity exercise and elevated cortisol. So exercise is actually a stressor on the body. And research has shown that intense exercise for an hour and 15 minutes results in a significant increase in cortisol levels that's even higher than those with a high cortisol disease like Cushing syndrome. Now levels do come down, uh, usually about an hour and a half after the exercise. And again, this rise in cortisol in response to exercise makes physiological sense. Cortisol's job is to break down fat to make it available to muscle when you need that energy. So high cortisol during or after exercise is actually just kind of a sign of an intense workout session. I really f***ed this up. I should have mashed the bananas before I added the mix. But here we are. But anyways, it has a stronger association with muscle gain after strength workouts than testosterone and growth hormone. And when cortisol is given as a drug, it actually improves exercise performance. So this is not all a bad thing. And even though exercise increases cortisol during and following a workout, it actually decreases it at other times in the day, especially at nighttime. So it's important to note that regular exercise overall actually reduces daily cortisol levels. Even if we look at the research on like elite sprinters and look at their like super intense training sessions, their cortisol levels on average are lower than those who don't exercise. So I don't want anyone thinking that exercise is suddenly bad. In fact, high cortisol post-exercise is actually kind of what we want. But this is where things get a little complicated. So a lot of folks will suggest that exercising too intensely, like doing HIIT training, can lead to chronically high cortisol levels, which again, is not what we want. And while there is some cases where over-exercising can cause daily levels of cortisol to climb, it's generally still more likely to reduce daily cortisol. Except when you combine that over-exercising with a restrictive diet. So for example, some women who end up losing their period because they restrict calories and or carbs and they engage in high levels of activity tend to have higher cortisol levels and a 7% lower resting metabolic rate than would be otherwise expected. This relationship isn't fully consistent and we also don't really know if high cortisol levels cause menstrual dysfunction and lower metabolism or whether the cortisol is just kind of like along for the ride. But this is just one example of the impact that dietary restriction can have on daily cortisol. And I'm gonna be diving into way more of that in a moment. Bottom line, exercise might increase cortisol transiently, but overall, it actually has a cortisol lowering effect. And it's not until we get into under fueling that exercise that we may be putting our metabolism and hormones at risk. Next, let's talk about weight loss diets on cortisol levels. So dieting, AKA caloric restriction, is another big stressor on the body. Research suggests that the greater the caloric deficit, the higher the cortisol levels with long-term fasting, aka two or more days without eating anything, resulting in the greatest increases in cortisol. And this again makes complete sense considering that the body would wanna break down all of its energy sources when it's just not getting enough through food. Now, considering that we made the association or the connection that high cortisol can increase belly fat storage and that dieting increases cortisol, it would make sense that high cortisol is associated with impaired weight loss, right? Not so fast. Now hold your horses. Research actually suggests that there is no association with cortisol levels and someone's ability to effectively lose weight. Some studies actually find that higher cortisol levels while dieting is associated with 
higher weight loss levels. And this is not to say that high cortisol increases weight loss. It actually does not. Again, it can actually cause belly fat storage as we discussed. But at the end of the day, folks, calorie deficiency causes both an increase in cortisol and an increase in weight loss. If you're in a calorie deficit, it is very unlikely that cortisol will make you gain belly fat, but it may mean that you hold on to that belly fat while losing from other places in the body which again is usually not what we want. Now, when discussing intermittent fasting, things are a little more complicated. Again, any caloric or energy deficit will increase cortisol. But if we intermittent fast and we skip dinner, aka what we call early time restricted feeding, so let's say you know, you're eating from eight in the morning till 4 p.m., we actually don't see a rise in cortisol. And this is even in cases where there's a caloric deficit. But in folks that skip breakfast, aka late time restricted feeding, which is what most people do when they intermittent fast, or maybe you're eating between like 12 and 8 p.m., this is where we see a significant increase in cortisol levels at night. And this is particularly being demonstrated in those who practice Ramadan fasting, where cortisol levels have shifted towards later in the day, and that actually has a detrimental impact on people's sleep. So diets increase cortisol, but that connection doesn't seem to be directly impairing weight loss, even though it may potentially make losing belly fat more challenging. Now, the more likely mediator for impaired weight loss is food choices and appetite. In other words, stress and cortisol seem to impact food quality and quantity more so than food choices are impacting cortisol and stress. So one way to temporarily reduce our cortisol levels is by eating delicious calorie dense food, especially foods that are high in sugar and fat. And this is why we typically crave foods like chocolate and candy when we're stressed. And obviously these cravings tend to be most intense in folks who are also on a weight loss diet. Cortisol also seems to increase our hunger hormones like ghrelin and make us just want to eat more. So one study found that those on IV drugs that raise cortisol levels ate 1.5 times more calories than they normally would. So bottom line, the hormone cortisol isn't preventing weight loss. It's likely just making you crave more caloric foods that make staying in a calorie deficit a lot more difficult. So cortisol may not be as bad as wellness culture makes it out to be, but we still don't want it to be chronically high. So how would you even know if it was high in the first place? First of all, if you're at all concerned, speak to your doctor about your symptoms and ask for a referral to an endocrinologist. Unfortunately, the signs of high cortisol are kind of so common that they could be caused by a ton of different things. But some of the most common ones are things like waking in the midsection, but nowhere else, severe fatigue, slow wound healing, muscle weakness, and muscle loss. Now there are tests that are used in clinical practice like the uh, dexamethasone test, 24 hour urinary cortisol excretion, and the salivary cortisol test, which tests across the day. Now the at-home Dutch test is a bit controversial, but they do offer a salivary cortisol that uses similar assays to what is used in clinical research. I would just be wary of some of their other hormone tests that haven't been well validated or proven to reliably test what they say they do. Now, in terms of what to do about it, it really depends on the cause. If someone is over-exercising and they're restricting their diet and as a result, they've got hypothalamic amenorrhea, then they need to exercise less and eat more. And this is where a dietitian could be a really helpful player. Now, if it's related to medication, like medications like ADHD meds or other health conditions like Cushing syndrome, then of course you're gonna wanna talk to your doctor about your options. Now, psychiatric disorders are actually the most common cause of elevated cortisol, not dieting, not exercising as so many people like to think in the wellness culture. Even if you don't have a psych disorder that's been diagnosed, we know that strategies like CBT, meditation, and mindfulness exercises can all help to bring those levels down. Bottom line, chronic levels of high cortisol can cause fat redistribution to the belly. And belly fat is a real concern when it comes to risk of chronic disease. But if you gain weight and fat and have high cortisol, it's not because cortisol is reducing your metabolism. It's not because it's making you lazy or fatigued and want to exercise less. And outside of the specific scenarios that we just discussed, it's not even because you're doing intense exercise or restricting your calories or doing both. It's most 
likely because those high cortisol levels increase hunger hormones, increase cravings, increase emotional eating, and as a result, increase excess caloric consumption. And on that note, thank you again to the team at Unlock for their support on this research. If you like it, be sure to give it the thumbs up or a dirty finger up, whatever works. <laughs> Leave me a comment below about who or what you'd like to see me talk about next. Subscribe to the channel, and I'll see you next time on Abby's Kitchen. Bye!